you're raising a child with anxiety or OCD, you should know about PANDAS or PANS. And if you're a medical provider or a therapist, you should definitely know about it. We're gonna be talking all about it in this interview. Stay tuned, that's what's up next. If you are loving somebody or treating somebody who has OCD-like symptoms, you should definitely know about PANDAS and PANS. And that is why I invited Beth Maloney to my show. She is an awesome advocate for PANDAS and PANS. She is a mom and she is the author of Saving Sammy and Childhood Interrupted, which to me is the Bible for PANDAS and PANS. So here is my interview with Beth. If you want to reach Beth, you can go to pandashealth.com. She is a wealth of information. Well, I want to welcome Beth Maloney to the show. I was so excited to have you on the show because lots of people talk about you. You're an incredible advocate in the Pandas and Pans community. And a lot of people don't understand that issue. And so I have a zillion questions to ask you okay. to help other people understand what it is and how they can help their kids and how they can detect it. So I wonder if we can start with you just explaining what PANDAS and PANS is for everybody. Certainly. And thank you for having me on. I'm so delighted anytime I can reach new people and fill them in about this. So I really appreciate it. These two disorders are infection triggered. And what happens is instead of a traditional symptom of an infection, for example, a sore throat from a strep infection, the symptoms are behavioral. Generally, you have a child who is a certain way, a certain personality, perhaps they're easygoing, they do well in school, and then they change. The change might be abrupt or it might be over a period of time that when you look back, you think this is very different. So I'll give you an example. In a young child, let's say you have a daughter who's very excited about going to kindergarten, can't wait to get started, gets up every day, can't wait to get there, and then she doesn't wanna go. And this may have started slowly, or it may be that one day she simply refuses. The traditional reaction to that would be Teachers will wonder what's going on in the home. Um, doctors might want to rule out ADHD. Uh, no one usually thinks, I wonder if she has an infection. Right. And a lot of times that is the cause. And when it is caught promptly and treated with antibiotics, it does not become chronic. It doesn't become disabling. And parents then recognize, oh, she's having this particular issue. She's having separation anxiety. That means what we're really looking at is an infection. The mechanism is that antibodies, which is what we produce to fight infections, start targeting other cells other than the infection. So ordinarily, you have a bacteria or a virus, but let's use a bacteria. Your autoimmune, your immune system produces antibodies to fight the infection, but it, they misidentify and they think that what they are attacking is the bacteria, but in fact, it's other cells. It happens, for example, with something called rheumatic fever, where strep antibodies attack the heart. In this situation, strep antibodies attack the basal ganglia of the brain and it produces behaviors. So that in a nutshell is the disorder. PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Disorders Associated with Strep. PANS is Pediatric Acute Onset Neurological Syndrome. So 
An autoimmune reaction is when your immune system essentially is overreacting. So you have an infection, your immune system does the right thing, it kicks up the antibiotics to fight the bacteria, but it keeps going and going and going and going and going and going. So it's an auto, it becomes an autoimmune reaction. And unless the underlying infection is appropriately treated, you're not going to stop that autoimmune reaction because it is the infection that's causing the production of the cells, the antibodies that keep going and don't stop. And so without treatment, the behaviors escalate and your child who had separation anxiety may now have compulsive behaviors, maybe wetting the bed, um, may have tics, may have a whole hope, may start pulling her hair, may have a whole host of symptoms that just keep growing and growing and growing because the underlying cause has not been addressed. Okay. And that's a great explanation to kind of just put it in a nutshell. So are there symptoms that parents should look for that kind of have a, a pandas or pants indicator to it? Well, in Childhood Interrupted, I actually list all the different symptoms. One big red flag is bedwetting. You have a child who is toilet trained and suddenly can't stop going at night, going at school. Um, there can be excessive wiping. So a child who just never feels they're, they're clean, they may keep having to wipe themselves after they go to the bathroom. They may scrub their hands until uh, you can have kids who, whose hands are raw from just scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. Repetition often shows up. So um, you might have constant checking. I, is the door locked? Is the door not locked? I need to look at it. Are my books in the book pack? Did I do that homework right? Wait, I have to erase that answer. I have to do it again. So you may have that or you may have, you may ask a simple question as a parent, would you like mac and cheese for dinner or whatever? And the child says, mac and cheese. Wait, did I say mac and cheese? Maybe not mac. And maybe I'd like some rice with some chicken. No, I don't think I want to say that. No, let's do the mac and cheese. Wait, what is it? So you, you, you might see that or it might be what time is your friend coming over? He's coming at three. Did I say three? No, I, I didn't mean three. I meant 315. Wait, maybe he did say three. So you have this getting stuck. Mm -hmm. um, the separation anxiety is a big symptom. To the point that a parent can't even go to the bathroom without the child wanting to be in the same room with them. Mm -hmm. The child used to sleep in his or her bed alone and now won't sleep alone. So those are, I would say, classic symptoms. And then you have tics. You can have eye blinking. You can have head rolling, jaw stretching. Those are tics that are, that are often diagnosed as Tourette syndrome without ever wondering, maybe this child has an infection. Right. And I, as I hear you talking about this, I want, it's such a struggle because as a child therapist, I see those things all the time in anxiety and especially in OCD. And I wonder, do you just test every child who has OCD for pandas or pans? Or how do you tell the difference? Because if it runs in your family, like if OCD runs in your family and then your child's presenting with all these symptoms, do you rule out pandas and pans? In my opinion, you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not a doctor, but it seems to me that if you have a child who is heavily burdened with symptomatic behaviors and there's a possibility that these behaviors could be reduced or eliminated, with a simple prescription of antibiotics, then of course, any parent would say, I'll give it a try. The yeah. Pro the problem is that you're going to run into um, difficulty from a lot of physicians who the risk of antibiotics has been so driven into their heads that they're just unwilling to try. Yes, there are risks to antibiotics, but I personally know what it is like to have a totally dysfunctional child who couldn't even get to school 
So I'll take that risk. Right. And I want to touch on that. We'll go back to that because that's a big question as far as one, treatment protocol, and two, the extent of being on antibiotics. That's, um, I want to go back, though, to the symptoms first because I know as a mental health professional, once I read your book a couple of years ago, I became a big proponent of telling everybody about pandas and pans and, and go get checked and it's important to just rule it out. But ironically, with my own child, I completely missed it because uh-huh. he was showing classic signs of OCD, you know, and it runs rampant in my family. Mm-hmm. And so the wiping did not, that was not on my radar. I mean, that, I see that in so many kids with OCD that he was constantly wiping, constantly feeling like he was dripping, which mm-hmm. I didn't realize was probably the urinary incontinence that he was feeling. Mm-hmm. And you know, we were getting toilet paper stacked up in our bathroom and I thought, what is going on with him? And then that passed and then the food restriction started to happen. Major, major food restriction. Oh, that's a big symptom I should have mentioned, of course. Yeah. And that's the one that I think gets on the radar quicker than a lot of the other ones because you see that in OCD, but you don't see it as like overwhelming as you do, I think, with pandas and pans where kids are getting G-tubed and are not eating at all. Right. And it wasn't really until my son was put on antibiotics that he got better. And that's only in the last, I would say, month. Uh-huh. But I completely missed it. Uh-huh. And so I think that that's the hard part with parents and totally therapists, too. I feel like mental health professionals are not educated on this at all. But we see classic OCD symptoms and we, we go to SSRIs and, um, and therapy and then we expect that that will fix it. When nothing, ERP didn't help my son, Mm -hmm. and Zoloft didn't help my son, um, amoxicillin helped my son. Right. Right. Well, I want to make two points here. Um, First of all, I'm glad you brought brought up the food restriction because that is important. And I think one of the reasons that that gets more attention is because that's life threatening. If someone won't stop checking their backpack, that's not life threatening. But when someone is, isn't eating, red flags go off. Now, two things I would say. It's important when, when you say or anyone says, well, there's a history of this in my family. Now, in Sammy's case, my son's case, we had no history, even though the doctor told me he was sure I would find one if I looked hard enough. There was no history, so I could rule it out. However, you have to remember two things about family histories. First of all, autoimmune diseases run in families. Secondly, the history in your family could very well be triggered by infection. It doesn't mean that because it's in a family that, it, that the cause of it was not an infection. It could have just not been diagnosed. Yeah, and that's an interesting point. Second point I would make is that typically, these children do not respond to the SSRIs. So, and that is clearly demonstrated in Saving Sammy. My son was getting psychiatric medication. It wasn't working. And I kept waiting for it to work and it wasn't working. And so that was like putting a Band-Aid You cut your thumb, you just stick a Band-Aid around it, your infection keeps growing, growing, growing. You say, well, I have the Band-Aid on. It's not doing any good. Yeah. So that's pretty classic that the children just don't respond. Yeah, and I think that was eye-opening to me because not only did he not respond, but he got a lot worse. And so that was was what kind of opened my eyes up to thinking, this has to, I have to look at something else. Well, I feel like, Right. You were not addressing the infection. So the cause, the reason he was getting worse was because nothing was addressing that underlying infection. Right. He just kept getting worse. And it's confusing because a lot of mental health professionals, and I go to these OCD conferences and I hear people talking, and there's a lot of mixed messages because a lot of times I'll hear, it doesn't really matter if it's pandas or pans because you're still going to treat them the same. You're going to treat them with SSRIs and ERP. And I wonder, and obviously antibiotics, I think even those people would say that, but I wonder if that's true if, or you wouldn't go the SSRI route at all. 
Well, <clears throat> I'm fortunate that I'm not any kind of a doctor, so I don't have really any um, restrictions in terms of what I need to say, want to say. I, I don't have a medical license that's going to be attacked. I don't, I don't prescribe medication, so I'm not invested in a particular course of treatment. So what you, what you and your listeners or viewers may hear from me might be different than what you would hear at a conference. What I base it on is not just my experience with Sammy, but having talked to you know, hundreds of parents have received tens of thousands of emails. If the infection is identified at the outset, you really shouldn't have to do anything. A any more than if your child had a raging sore throat and you took, the doc took your child to the doctor and the child was prescribed amoxicillin, you, there's nothing more that you would have to do for the sore throat other than make sure that the prescription was taken for the entire prescribed period and then go back if it wasn't if it didn't go away now this is a little bit of a side point but just to be clear for everyone the reason why antibiotics are prescribed in that situation is not to eliminate the sore throat it's to eliminate the risk of rheumatic fever it's to eliminate the chance that strep is going to continue to grow and that antibodies are going to attack the heart and you're going to end up with heart damage. That's why we prescribe antibiotics. So wouldn't it make sense if we knew that another symptom of a strep infection was behavioral, that we would treat to eliminate the behavioral symptoms as well? Yeah. Um, however, if it's caught at the outset, shouldn't be a problem to treat. If it progressive, progresses and becomes chronic before it's identified, there may have to be some intervention with psychiatric medication. SSRIs tend to exacerbate behavioral symptoms. So that for the um, doctors who are really savvy about treating it, who treat a lot of these patients, they're probably not going to prescribe an SSRI. Mm -hmm. And as far as intervention with cognitive behavioral therapy, the kids may be too sick to benefit from it at all. Now, yeah. Sammy, one other symptom I want to mention, by the way, is a deterioration in handwriting. Mm -hmm. That's also a big big symptom. So you've got a grade schooler, or a middle schooler who's writing beautifully or drawing microscopes or whatever they're doing. And then suddenly they really can't write. That's another symptom. Mm -hmm. But what you would see from reading Saving Sammy is he was too sick to benefit from the behavior. I took him to endless sessions. We made no progress at all. Once the infection was identified, once he then received appropriate treatment and then had been taking antibiotics for a couple of months, then we could go back to the cognitive behavioral therapy and he needed it. He would not have recovered fully had we not intervened there. And the um, example that I use in Childhood Interrupted Frankly, think of it as biting your nails. If you have been biting your nails for three years, you're going to need some help to stop. Right. Whatever it is, whether you're putting Band-Aids on the end of your figure, fingers or painting it with that or whatever. It's not like you just one day it's, get up. So it's the same thing. These become very ingrained habits and patterns. And if it's serious enough, the children do need help to break them and in in um, Childhood Interrupted, I have a chapter about cognitive behavioral therapy. And, yeah, I thought, uh, that's great. One reason, by the way, that I wrote that book is because I had tens of thousands of emails from people, and the questions were largely the same. Parents run into the same issues. They yeah. fall into the same categories. So I actually did think if I just wrote a book, it would save me some time because I wouldn't oh, yeah. be answering these emails all the time because I recognized the answers were becoming largely repetitive. 
Yeah, and that book is truly the Bible, I think. It is a framework for parents, and I have it on a digital copy on my iPad, and I had read it before my son was even on the radar for Pandas, and I find myself going back to it now over and over again, depending on what stage I am with him, and right. saying, like, what does Beth say about this? And, yeah. and it's clearly outlined, so it's really that was, helpful. That was my goal. You know, my goal, I'm not, I'm not mentioning it because – I need to sell the books. I'm mentioning it because it has become such a resource. In both books, I tried to write the book that I wish someone had given me. And yeah. so that's been my approach. What do I wish someone could have handed me? And very little, uh, Childhood Interrupted came out in 2013 and virtually nothing has changed. The only thing I would say, and I'm sure people would disagree with me, but the only significant thing that I think has happened is that there was a study that demonstrated that the antibodies, the strep antibodies, probably reached the brain through the nasal passage. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, but other than that, everything in there is up to date. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I want to go back so I think we kind of got an outline of some of the symptoms, which sound almost identical to pretty much any kind of onset of OCD, minus mm -hmm. the tics. You know, you have tics can definitely, you can have tics with OCD. Um, the handwriting, I think, is unique to pandas and pans. I think mm -hmm. the sudden bedwetting with all these other symptoms is unique to pandas and pans. So those mm -hmm. are two definite indicators that would, I think, separate things out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. How do parents go about getting diagnosed? That's a huge question that everybody always asks. Okay, so in terms of getting diagnosed, you have a couple of routes that you can follow. Um, first of all, in my personal opinion, this really does start as a strep infection. There are other things that come along. There is mycoplasma. Uh, kids end up with, um, you know, mono. Um, other, the Coxsackie, but I really in my heart believe that the initial trigger is strep. I could be totally wrong about that, but so let's go with strep. Okay. So let's say your child starts wetting her bed or he has the separation anxiety or his handwriting is deteriorating or suddenly he's not eating. Um, and I do want to mention that not eating could also indicate Lyme. So okay. we, we should come back to Lyme because that's a different, that's very different. Hmm. Mechanism is different. I think sometimes it's lumped under that pan's umbrella. I don't really think it should be. But anyway, hmm. so let's get back to the diagnosis. So you have a behavior. You suspect this. First thing, you're going to go to the pediatrician. You're going to have them run a rapid strep test. If that comes back negative, then you're going to say, I want an overnight culture because that is more accurate. And if it still is negative, then you would like to get a blood test, an ASO titer test, and this is mentioned in the book. And very often what will happen is the level of antibodies that that shows you to group A strep is elevated. And therefore you, have, you know that your child has had this infection that has not been treated. True, not all children will test positive on all those things and still have pandas. Yes, that's true. But then you have a more complicated case. And I think most kids, you're going to pick it up. Then you have to say, okay, is anybody else in the house sick? Are there carriers here? Do I maybe have strep? And I'm the carrier, meaning I have no symptoms at all, but I carry strep. So those need to be addressed. You have a sibling who's coming home sick all the time and you think he's got a cold. Maybe it's not a cold. Maybe he's actually carrying some sort of a bacteria. Now how, how long can people be carriers? I know that might be a dumb question. For their life. For their life? For their life. So Interesting. You could be a carrier. So I will hear from parents, for example, I was just speaking to one two or three days ago, and um, they, they get the child to baseline, and then suddenly she just decompensates. 
So I said, well, has anybody else in the house been tested? No. Well, I said, well, it's quite possible that somebody is sick and reinfecting this child. We had a, one that's mentioned in Childhood Interrupted where there were three sisters. And it was the middle sister, severe eating disorder, ends up in the hospital, eating disorder. They actually said, have you ever heard of pandas, which is, you know, incredible. But anyway, a child gets treated, comes home, gets incredibly sick again. They go through this two or three times. Turns out the oldest sister was a carrier. And in that situation, the mom even had the dog tested, which involved, you have to knock a dog out to get a throat culture. I said to her, next time, just have the vet give them clavamox. Vets are not, <laughs> vets are not really worried about the risk of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. They're willing to prescribe. Yeah. So if, you, if you have a dog in the house, just eliminate the possibility that someone in the home is a carrier. Of course, if the kids are in school and they're exposed, they can be reinfected. But hopefully what's going to happen is you're going to recognize that there's an infection. The diet, you're going to be one of the people who's lucky enough where the tests actually show it, probably after you fight with the pediatrician to run the culture or right. whatever required. And the culture comes back and it's positive. And let's hope you cut it right away. And you go on two weeks of antibiotics and the behaviors go away and everything's great. And then it happens again. And this time the pediatrician hopefully is a little bit more on board. But a lot of times, honestly, it's a real struggle, which yeah. is what I have on, on my website, if you go, which is pandashelp.com. And if you go there on the home page is a little blue box that says list of providers. And if you click on that, that will take you to a state-by-state -state listing of, of doctors, of therapists, of support groups for parents. And some states have more resources than others. Yeah. Um, I believe in Arizona, there are resources. The Northeast has a lot of resources. California does not. Washington State does not. So, unfortunately, it, it kind of depends on where you are in terms of whether you're going to get help or not. No. Do you think parents, if they do have resources in their state, should they bypass their pediatrician and just go to a panda specialist or should they get the preliminary testing done by their pediatrician? You're going to get into a pediatrician much more quickly than you're going to be able to get into one of these doctors. There are pediatricians who are um, well read and will assist you and are willing to treat the children. One of the things that I do point out to parents is that Childhood Interrupted is not just for parents. It actually interviews a lot of top physicians, and those interviews are woven throughout the book. And in the back of the book are whole pages of interviews with these doctors. And there are some doctors who are willing to read that book and follow the doctor's advice in the book and treat children. If you have one of those pediatricians in your life, you're very lucky, and I would try to go as far with that as you could because the specialists are very hard to see, very expensive, and um, you might have some luck locally. But if you get in there and you can tell you're in for battle, I, don't waste, I tell parents, don't waste your time. Just find someone else. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think it is a battle for, unfortunately, for a lot of parents. Yes. And some doctors are willing to test, um, and maybe the tire levels come back normal. Would you recommend, recommend them doing like a Cunningham panel or something that's a little bit more comprehensive? Okay, so a Cunningham panel is a good diagnostic tool. Um, however, what I'd really, really like which I've advocated with the American Academy of Pediatrics and not making a lot of progress, to say the least, is when the kids present with these behaviors, can we just see what happens if we put them on 10 days of an antibiotic? Mm -hmm. Can we just try it and see if there's an improvement? 
Um, to me, that's a lot quicker, less expensive. And yeah. if you are looking at trying to convince someone, the Cunningham panel isn't going to make a difference anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, that will be good information when you get, if you're then going to see a specialist because you're able to say, I've got this. But if you, if you have a local doctor who's willing to really, I mean, there are doctors who will consult with these. So there's a, you know, there are doctors on the East coast who would be happy to have a phone call with your doctor in Arizona or South Dakota. If mm -hmm. That would help move it along. And that's going to really be your best resource. And you, I think, can tell whether you have a good pediatrician or not. Is this a person who's real? Does this person listen to you? Yeah. You know, are, are they helpful? Are they, do they explain things in a way that you can understand it? Are they willing to work with you in other situations? If your pediatrician right now is a judgmental, uncooperative, always in a hurry type person, my recommendation is you make a switch. I, I'm a lawyer. For some reason, until Sammy got so sick, I didn't understand that doctors like lawyers are all very different. There are great ones, and there are some that aren't, aren't good at all. And I thought that because I didn't have that um, sort of that uh, orientation, let's say, that anybody who became a doctor was, they were all on the same plateau. Now, I'm very different about it in terms of any kind of medical care. I'm very insistent that I have a doctor on board who's excellent. Otherwise, I don't stay with them. So the time to actually find a good pediatrician is before you run into this kind of stuff. Right, yeah. And even if you have a good pediatrician, they may not be educated about it. Um, like with, with my son, not to keep talking about him, but you know, his titer levels are normal. And so besides him having a lot of the classic symptoms, uh, and his symptoms started at eight months old, and then he did okay until he was about seven. So he had a really long period. And my doctor was okay. He, he was supportive of pandas, but he was not comfortable with long-term antibiotics. Right. And my son drastically changed on antibiotics, mm -hmm. but then they took him off and they said, okay, well, a month, that's enough. And he, he reverted right back. Well, you're bringing up two very good points there. First of all, it's very important for parents to document this and document the response so that if you are in the position of having to work with a pediatrician who's kind of grudgingly going along, but maybe they are going along, you're able to say, look, this is a clip from my cell phone that I took of him before. Here's one during. We stopped the antibiotics. Here's after. We're right back where we were. It's very hard to um, argue with visual testimony, let's mm -hmm. call it. And I was very... Um, diligent about outlining at that point in time things weren't quite as electronically you know we didn't have everything that we've got right now mm -hmm. um, but, um, so I had to use a big video camera to tape him and I also kept really impeccable records what I fed him what he was doing at certain times of day what medication he had it became very helpful to me for another reason which is when the children recover, they tend to recover in waves. They do better, they do better, they do better, there's a dip. They do better, they do better, they do better, there's a dip. And so it was very helpful to me personally to be able to look at my notes and say, oh, we went through this before. Yeah. So documentation is really essential. And secondly, strep does not develop a resistance to penicillin. Amoxicillin is penicillin-based. Augmentin is penicillin-based. This is information that I saw Susan Sweeto, Dr. Susan Sweeto from the National Institute of Mental Health repeat at a conference, and I think it was at UC Davis, so I saw it online. So I'm not making this up. Penicillin, strep does not develop a resistance to penicillin, 
And penicillin effectively treats two things, strep and syphilis. So the risk of having a child on a long-term penicillin uh, medication, penicillin-based medication, I don't really understand what that is. So that might be a question that you could ask your doctor who may not even know that that, that is the case, that mm -hmm. only strep and syphilis are treated by penicillin and therefore what is the risk? You know, the other thing I would say is that um, if you go to the website for the National Institute of Mental Health and you look up rheumatic fever, a neurological symptom of rheumatic fever, again, that's where strep antibodies attack the heart and a person can end up with heart damage and die from it, as people did. Um, uh, a neurological symptom is something called Sydenham's chorea, which is a movement disorder. So uh, rheumatic fever patients who have developed Sydenham's chorea, pediatric patients are on penicillin for 10 years for that. So, yeah. so what is the problem if it's uh, bedwetting, anxiety, food restriction? Why can those children not be on penicillin, but children with, who've shown Sydenham's chorea, they're going to be on penicillin. Why is it safe? Why is right. it safe in one situation and not the other? It right. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and, and I think that's the struggle that I think parents are having with pediatricians is they feel like it's dangerous or it's going to compromise their immune system to have them on, on these antibiotics. Which so, right, and so then it becomes a matter of you actually have more information than they do because I've right. now laid out two specific things. Number one, uh, you know, nothing develops a resistance to, uh, to the, the penis, the strep never develops a resistance to penicillin. Penicillin only treats two bacteria. So what is our problem here? Number two, if long-term antibiotics are appropriate for Sydenham's chorea, and rheumatic fever, and that's listed right on the website for the National Institute of Mental Health. Why is it a problem for my son or my yeah, daughter? Right. Now, is that this might be a dumb question, but is that different than zithromycin, or is that yeah. all the same family? No, no, that's a different. Zithromycin is different because, unfortunately, some children are allergic to penicillin, so it's not going to work for everyone. And it's weird because it seems like the go-to medication or at least from my own experience, is that they give zithromycin. They give zithromycin because it is a broad-spectrum antibiotic. It will, penicillin, like I said, strep and syphilis. Yeah. Zithromycin will go after strep. It will go after mycoplasma. If there is some other bacteria, it might be somewhat effective against Lyme. So it's broad-spectrum. Okay, I get it. So if you think the child has an infection, but you're not exactly sure what it is, that's what you can go with. So if your child's responding to amoxicillin, then that's a pretty good indicator Then you're looking at probably strep as your culprit. Right. And, and also, why can't I just keep him on the amoxicillin? Because this is, I get it. This is the child I have when he's on amoxicillin. This is the child I have when he's not. So why can't I keep him on? Don't just tell me there's a risk. I want to know what is the risk? What's the risk? Yeah. And I think it's good to educate. Unfortunately, as parents, we're going to have to educate our doctors. And that becomes a challenge because yeah. there, there are a lot of doctors who really aren't going to want you sitting in the room saying, and what exactly is that risk? Because I know that blah, 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 blah. So yeah. you are going to have to strike a delicate balance between having the information and really demanding the answers. And wouldn't it be great if a doctor said to you, wow, you know what? Let me look into that. I didn't know. Yeah. That's the kind of doctor you want because you're not going to sit and you can't. One thing I would say is you can't expect doctors to know everything. They're not going to know everything. And the doctor you're seeing may not know about pandas. They're not teaching pandas in medical school. Some hospitals mention it, some don't. Uh, 
Cincinnati Children's is just forget it. You know, so if you happen to do your training at Cincinnati Children's, you're going to think pandas is just absolutely ridiculous because they're a bastion of not recognizing. Or if you do your training at Boston Children's Hospital, no, pandas doesn't exist. So yeah. that doesn't mean, though, that your individual physician might nonetheless be interested in learning about it, be willing to work with you, and be open to new things, which is really what we want from doctors. It is impossible to know everything about medicine. You wouldn't go into your pediatrician and expect them to know all about the most cutting edge cancer treatments. Or if you do, then don't do it anymore because it's not gonna happen. Right, exactly. You just want a doctor who is open to this and willing to work with you. Well, and thankfully, there are becoming more panda specialists. You know, I'm very fortunate because Arizona does have a lot of resources that I've been able to tap into compared to other states. Right. Um, the other struggle, separate from your doctors, can be your insurance. So that was the other question I got from my audience was some people, antibiotics isn't enough, and they have to do IVIG or other invasive procedures. And right. the doctor's okay with it, but then insurance won't cover it. Correct. That is an unfortunate reality. Yeah. So you, you can appeal that, but if your provider, uh, your insurance provider, has taken the position that they're not going to cover it, then they won't. Particularly, depending on the codes, every Thing that gets submitted to an insurance has a code. So when you get it, when you go to the doctor and they give you a copy of the receipt, there's a little code there, boxes check for whatever it is that you've gone in for, whether it be an infection or an earache or, you know, there's a diagnosis, diagnostic code. Sometimes if the uh, code is written differently, so for example, it's some sort of an encephalitis, then the IVIG will be approved. So it will be approved for something like Kawasaki's disease. Those children get IVIG. For pandas, I'm really at this point not aware of any um, uh, insurance company that's covering it for pandas. No. But the other thing is I would say, okay, before taking that step, has the child really been sufficiently treated with antibiotics for a long enough period of time. Because what I do here is that there is, you know, well, we tried it for 21 days, it didn't work, we're gonna to go to IVIG. Um, that's a problem for a lot of reasons. I know families that have spent $100,000 on IVIG, the child's still sick. Yeah, that's sad. So it's a uh, nice money maker. For physicians, you might not, I'm sure that won't be, you know, a comment that doctors like to hear, but that's the reality. I mean, it is. You're, you're, you're not making money by writing prescriptions for amoxicillin. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to really advocate to make sure that your child has been fully treated before you take a step like that. And if they have, if they have been given long-term antibiotics in large doses, and there's, you're not making progress, and you're certain, I would say, okay, then why are you certain that's what this is? Because you, mm -hmm. sh you should get the response. Now, I do though wanna talk about Lyme a little bit. Lyme is different. You really, your son responded to amoxicillin. You know what's going on there. Let's say there's another child though who, who really isn't, fits, fits the, um, the diagnostic criteria and that you had one child and now you don't, you know, Th these are families who say I had a child who was fully functional and now she can't get out of the bedroom and we have to slip the food in under the door. Mm -hmm. So if it's not strep, if it's not mycoplasma, they're not responding to the psychiatric medication. They've been on long-term, these other antibiotics, they're really not working. Could it be Lyme? I mean, hopefully you're going to look for Lyme right away. But I spoke with a family just yesterday, actually, whose child had been in three or four different hospitals, this, that, all kinds of treatment, fighting for IVIG, going to see doctors, blah, blah, blah. And I said, did anyone test for Lyme? 
And she, the mom said, well, she must have because they ran all kinds of blood tests. She went back in the blood work and said, there's no Lyme. You have to test for Lyme. Mm -hmm. Lyme is different. Lyme is a bacteria that enters the brain as opposed to strep where the antibodies enter the brain. Lyme is a spirochete. It looks like a corkscrew. The thing that tipped me off to the fact that I think this other girl may have Lyme is because part of the mechanism in pandas, let's talk about a strep infection or mycoplasma, antibodies entering the brain through the nasal passages is inflammation. Ordinarily, our brains are protected by a very tight network of capillaries. So when we get sick, our brain doesn't get sick because our brain stays safe. But sometimes when we have an infection, there's inflammation in the system. The brain barrier becomes more permeable. So the capillaries expand. They're not like this anymore. They expand and things get in that wouldn't ordinarily get in. So if a child is then given an anti-inflammatory, like a steroid burst, for example, and you have this expanded capillaries and the tightens again, you will often see behavioral improvements. Why? Because strep antibodies or the antibodies are not entering the brain. They have a limited lifespan, so they die off. There's no more antibodies attacking. This is tight, so no more getting in. Child does better. However, if you don't see that reaction from a steroid burst or an anti-inflammatory, then maybe there's something else. And if Lyme is in the brain, that could be the, that could be the problem. Okay. And then what, how do they treat Lyme versus trap? Very heavy-duty antibiotics like doxycycline and you know, some pretty heavy duty antibiotics that you need to really see a Lyme doctor for, you know, mm -hmm. and again, you have a battle with infectious disease doctors who say, well, you know, they don't, there, there's no such thing as chronic Lyme and, you know, as if there isn't, but um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> whatever, uh, there is such a thing as chronic Lyme. And then you have to go to a Lyme doctor who someone else has recovered by seeing. Okay. You know, don't go to infectious disease at your hospital because they're probably going to tell you there's no such thing as chronic Lyme. So you need to go see a Lyme doctor. Yeah. Uh, and the other component to this is that whatever treatment um, your son responds to amoxicillin, he should be on an anti-inflammatory diet. He should uh, be taking something that is a non-steroidal NSDI, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So for example, an ibuprofen mm -hmm. or naproxen or something. Now how how long are kids supposed to be on that? Um, I mean, they yeah. had him on that for about a month and then they told me to take him off of the anti-inflammatory. That's good advice because you don't, you don't want to risk any other kind of organ damage, but what you can do is you can then switch to a different um, anti-inflammatory that is not, uh, it, the name of it actually, I can't remember, of course, it's in childhood interrupted. It's more of a supplement, but it, it's turmeric based. Okay. And, and you stop feeding your children things that, um, like sugar, for example. Sugar is a big inflammatory food, and it feeds bacteria. Huh. So if your child is sick with this, and he's eating popsicles and ice cream, dairy is also an inflammatory, you know, you're kind of, um, you're not meeting it halfway there. You're actually feeding the bacteria, and you're creating the uh, environment for there to be more of this, more inflammation, and the ability to get into the brain. Which is really good to know, because I think when you have a restrictive eater, you're just excited when they eat anything. Mm -hmm. And that becomes problematic. So yeah. when I give him, you know, um, food, sugar, foods that are sugar 
that break down into sugar generally are white, white bread, white rice, you know, so you want, if, if let's say all they'll eat is white bread, then you want to couple it with something hopefully like peanut butter that kind of slows down that breakdown process. Mm -hmm. um, but you will see that kids crave the foods that aren't good for them. And I think it's because the bacteria is pretty much calling the shots saying, this is what I need. So yeah, that's can... fascinating. Fascinating and scary all at the same time. <laughs> it is. Well, I have one more question to ask you before I let you go because I don't want to take up all your time. Yeah. Um, a lot of the pandas doctors that I see out here, at least, are very heavy into the supplements. Uh -huh. I mean, so kids are on like huge amounts of supplements. What, what's your thought on that? And if so, like, what should kids be taking? And I know you're not a doctor, but just from your experience. Well, I guess I would be asking, what is this supplement doing for my child? Because I'm not really clear. I suppose there's an idea here that we're trying to boost the immune system. So do I need to do that through a supplement? Or can I do it? Do I have a child who would be willing to maybe participate if we did a juicing kind of exercise here and throw everything in that he or she likes, including maybe pineapple and apples to sweeten it up. I prefer that kind of sugar um, to any other kind of sugar. Is that the goal of the supplement? What is the goal? That's what I would want to know. Yeah, that's a good ask, question. Ask questions. And then if it makes sense to you, what are you trying to do? You're trying to boost your immune system so that it has the ability to fight the infection. And you're trying to eliminate the infection as much as possible. So if it's accomplishing and you're trying to avoid uh, any kind of um, allergic reaction, which is why a lot of the kids go gluten-free. Mm -hmm. um, so how do these supplements fit into that game plan? And if someone can tell you that, great. But just don't do it because somebody told you. Yeah. That would be my main advice. Ask questions. Why, is this, why are you recommending this? What is it going to do? Yeah, and I think that overall, that's just the greatest message for this entire interview is you have to start steering the ship because if you don't ask questions, you're just going to be blindly following. And really, we're in the dark ages of this stuff. And so you have, to, you have to be in the frontier and ask questions and do your own research. Ask questions. And hopefully, if you've read Childhood Interrupted, you won't have to do too much of your own research. What I tried to do was really make things as, as in plain English as I possibly could. What I would have needed when I was completely stressed out didn't really have time to read anything, couldn't filter much information into my brain. Would this have made sense to me to read at that time? And it, it's, it's going to really put you in a position to have the information you need and, and, and know what the questions are to ask and be willing to do it and to feel pretty confident about what you're asking instead of, gee, you know, oh, is this a dumb question? No, it's a good question because you actually have so much information now at your disposal. It's probably more than, than the doctor may have. Yeah, I agree. And I think people should, you know, get tested. And even if the titers don't come back elevated, still, you know, a 10-day dose of antibiotics isn't a bad thing because my child never tested positive. And I think also the important thing that you mentioned as far as carriers, my six-year-old always had an itchy butt, you know, and when I went in to have my son tested, they tested him, he was negative, they tested her just because she had an itchy butt, and she had perianal strep, right. and she constantly has that, right. you know, almost more often than not. She probably is our little carrier in the house. She probably is, but is she being treated when you're saying she generally has it, is, is, is it because it really hasn't been treated sufficiently? That's what I would wonder. In other yeah. words, if the classic thing is we're going to put her on 10 days of antibiotics, you put her on the 10 days, she gets, you know, she gets better, and then she develops it again. Well, maybe that's just not enough. Maybe she needs a higher dose. Maybe she needs a longer period of time, but maybe you need to play around with that because she will reinfect your son. Yeah. You know? 
Well, my refrigerator is full of amoxicillin right now yeah. <laughs> because they're both on it. Okay, now remember, you've got to remember um, that amoxicillin as a liquid, it has an expiration date. You can't go past that expiration date. Yeah, no, luckily our pharmacy is really good and they give us the powder and water. Okay, and good. So we mix it um, after each new bottle. Oh, great, because I know but I think, family, uh, had that problem where they were – they would get the mixture for a month. It's actually mentioned in the book also. And sure enough, after about two weeks, the behavior started coming back. And then the doctor that they were seeing, who's a wonderful doctor, said, wait a second, what's going on with the medication? It turned out the medication was expired. Yeah, and that's a good thing to ask because I think people don't always know. Luckily, I feel like I'm very lucky because I'm around some people who kind of know what they're doing. Right. And even our pharmacist is giving us the powder. So. That is good. But I think the takeaway for other people is, you know, there's carriers, there's other kids in your house that could have strep and it, it doesn't always present itself with a sore throat. That's right. You know, so it can happen anywhere and it, right. it can't hurt to go and get people tested in your house. Right. To stay and, on top of it. And there's a doctor, um, Corinne, who's mentioned in the book. She really catches it early. She's a family practitioner. And if your son had gone in to see her, she would have just said, you know what, Let's try my antibiotics, we're going to run the test, but in the meantime, we're going to get them on the medication. That's what I wish every yeah. person in the United States would do. But maybe in time. Maybe in time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on. How can people find your books? Because they are really the only resource out there that is that comprehensive. If you go to pandashelp.com, you can click through to the books. You okay. See. You can also find them on Amazon. Okay. Um, you know, um, and, and Childhood Interrupted is only on Amazon. Uh, Saving Sammy, you can get on any online seller. But if you go to my website, it's kind of easy. I always try to put articles on there, you'll see, that are helpful. And I try not to get too, too technical. I, I don't think the technical stuff really helps us as moms and dads too much, you know. That is so true. That is very, very true. Well, I will leave a link below to okay, your website great. so that people just know how to reach you and get all your resources. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. I hope you found that interview as informative and helpful as I did. I came away from that interview with incredible information, stuff I did not know before that helps me professionally and with my own child. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you're enjoying these videos as I'm trying to spread information and education to those around me. So hit like, hit subscribe, and don't miss my videos. Most of the time I'm making videos directly for kids who with anxiety and OCD and teaching them how to navigate and not just crush, but thrive with these issues. I also have a zillion parenting topics, so you can check out my playlist below and hopefully find some good topics that can help you and your family. I hope you find a sparkle in everything you do. Until next Thursday, take care.